Let's Talk. Let's Talk is an uncensored program on Family TV that attempts to answer questions that are unanswered within our chat settings. Questions like sex and money, uh, drugs and alcoholism, prophecy and prophets in our country. So, catch us every Tuesday on Family TV as we explore different topics and make attempts to answer the different life topics. With me, Manuel Odeke, let's talk. A good evening to all our dear viewers. My name is Emmanuel Odeke. Welcome to this episode of Let's Talk. It's another good evening here at uh, Church of Uganda Family TV. Yeah, it, is, it is at the center of the city. If you want to find us, you definitely get to Church House along Kampala Road. That's where you find us. And we enrich lives every time we are here. And then today on Let's Talk, we'll be speaking uh, Trinity. And that's what we'll be discussing. But before we get to the discussion, a lot is happening. Uh, Kenya decides today, so we are waiting to hear what happens uh, by the time uh, it, is, uh, it is fully declared. In, in the Diocese of Kampala, they are celebrating 50 years, which is definitely a jubilee. And so uh, it is another exciting thing that uh, you need to know about. But don't forget to pray for Mbale and whatever is happening there together with Karamoja, the hunger that is that side. And if you can support in any way, that should be very, very important and, and helpful. So that is, that is on, uh, on, on the lighter side of, of the show. Uh, but today we'll be discussing Trinity. It has, uh, this, this topic has, discussed, uh, has been discussed quite often, but it has left many people confused. So today, um, as usual, the Reverend Rogers is here to make matters of Trinity clear. So when he's here, I do the less of the talking, he does most of the talking. Reverend Rogers, you're welcome. Thank you. How about you say hello to our viewers, then we can get into our discussion today. Good evening, our viewers. It's always a privilege to be in the studios of Church of Uganda Family TV. It's a great privilege for me to get to share with you, especially from God's Word. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Rogers. Uh, that is, uh, Reverend Rogers is the regional coordinator for ACFA, African Center for Apologetics Research. That's what he does. So, uh, Reverend Rogers, we are discussing Trinity. What is Trinity? This whole thing of tree, tree, tree. What is it about? Then we can get into the depth of the matter. The topic of the day makes me tremble because when we talk about the Trinity, we are talking about one of the most profound mysteries that we find in all of Scripture because it has to do with the self-revelation of God. I should quickly remind you that this is a topic that has been debated in the corridors of church history since the apostles' time. In fact, even the councils that formulated the creeds that we know today in the church was because of controversies that surrounded important doctrines like one of the Trinity. So when we talk about a topic like this, we must remind ourselves that it's beyond our finite imagination and beyond comprehension that we would never know it apart from the self-revelation of God. And even though we read through scripture, we will note that the doctrine itself is quite complicated, a mystery, and so we approach the topic with great humility. When we think about the Trinity, by definition, we are thinking about a unity of three. In fact, the word Trinity comes from tri-unity. Tri meaning three, and then unity meaning one. So imagine we are discussing something that is a three of one, a tri-unity. I should quickly tell you that the word Trinity itself is not in the Bible. I meet many people who ask me, how come you Christians believe in the Trinity, yet we don't find this word anywhere in the Bible? And I usually ask them, do you believe the Bible? They say, yes. I ask them, is the word Bible in the Bible? <laughs> They say, oh, yeah, words don't have to be in the Bible in order for them to be true. What is most important is that as we define it as the triunity of God, we find the doctrine taught in various places or throughout scripture 
as we shall be seeing tonight. Now, as Christians, when we talk about the Trinity, we are basically discussing the Christian doctrine that teaches that God, who is one, has eternally, it, eternally exists in three persons. That God, who is one, eternally exists in three persons, and these persons are distinct from one another. Why do I use that word, distinct from one another? Because many people who think about the Trinity, some think that the, these three persons are one and the same. We have some religious groups that think that the Trinity is just titles of one God. Some other people have thought that it's just different offices, but occupied by the same one person. But that's not what we Christians believe. When we talk about the Trinity, we are saying that within the unity of one God, there is eternally existing three persons. These persons share the same essence of God as a being, but they are distinct from one another. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. It is very important that we understand that. And there are three levels basically in this definition. Number one, we are saying that there is one God, not three gods. Number two, we are saying that this one God eternally exists in three persons. And number three, we are saying that these persons are distinct from one another. They should not be confused one with another. Now, someone again might misunderstand this because usually we use the word person. And in our cultural context and understanding, person means two different entities. So when we think about persons, we actually think about three different people. But when the church or the scripture uses persons, it is not describing it in terms of human beings. It is describing it in terms of uh, uh, individual expression. That within these persons, we see them express individuality, express consciousness, express rationale, express will, and that's why we call them persons. Not necessarily that they are three different uh, human beings, as I have had some other people teach again. So, the Christian understanding of the Trinity is one God who has eternally revealed himself in three persons, and these three persons are distinct from one another. Of course, we will go ahead to unpack it as we move along and look at the different Bible passages that help us understand this. Okay, so does, does Scripture reveal the three persons clearly? Does Scripture reveal the doctrine of the three persons? Oh, yes. In fact, it might interest you to know that the whole Bible is basically established on the unity of these three persons. And when we talk about the three, we're not just talking about a couple scattered Bible verses that we might find in the New Testament. But the Trinity comes all the way from the Old Testament. In fact, right from the Old Testament, in the very first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, we see God talking about the creation of man and he uses a plural expression. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Meaning that within the one being of God is a plurality of persons. And that's why God can speak not just as an individual but using the plural form. Because there is more than one person within the one God. In fact, even Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, we read that then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now lest he stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. This is God describing the fall of man, and he's still using the plural language. He man has become like one of us. Now, I know some people who have said that God was meaning he was with the angels since he already had the angels in heaven. But if you go back to Genesis 1, where he says, let us create man in our own image. Angels are not created in the image of God. So there is no way God could have been referring to them by saying in, in our image. You come to Genesis 11 verse 7, uh, we read again that the Tower of Babel, he says, come... 
let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Us. You come to Genesis chapter 19 verse 24. It reads that then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Now, pause for a moment there. That the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah fire and brimstone and where is it coming from? from the Lord out of heaven. Who are these two lords being mentioned here? One of them is raining down fire from the Lord out of heaven. So there seems to be a Lord out of heaven and there is one down here who is raining down fire. So again you can see that the scripture is talking about two lords. So you come to Psalm 45 verses 6 and 7 and we read that your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of uprightness is a scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you. God, your what? Your, your God. God has anointed you. But anointed who? Remember the verse began saying, You are thrown, O God. You are thrown, O God. One person. Mm -hmm. The Lord, your God, has anointed you. you again you can see that there is more than one person describing the same one god you continue you read several bible passages in fact even when you read isaiah 6 verse 8 he says that then i heard the voice of the lord saying whom shall i send who will go for us who will go for what for us not for me but who will go for us in the first part of the verse, he says, whom shall I send? In the second part of the same verse, he says, who will go for us? Again, you can see that God is using plural, meaning he's talking about the different persons within the one God. Again, you notice that scripture is not teaching that there are more than one God. But within that same one God, we see a plurality of personalities that are being mentioned here. In the whole Old Testament, the nation of Israel had always had a, 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 a teaching that confirmed the oneness of God. We find that in Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, where, which was called the Hebrew Shema. And the verse says that, Hear, O Israel, Jehovah our God is one. In the Old Testament, Israel would have killed you just for saying there were more than one God. No wonder when Jesus comes in the New Testament, they want to stone him because he's claiming to be God. And they do not understand it. If the God of the Old Testament is one and there has never been an other, how can you come claiming that you are God? They, they didn't understand it. But again, if there is anything they confirmed is that even the Old Testament saints acknowledged one God. Yet within the same Old Testament, we see God revealing himself and describing himself as uh, different personalities or using plural form. In the Old Testament, you will also read a number of times about somebody called the angel of the Lord. We see the angel of the Lord visit Abraham, visit Isaac, visit Jacob, uh, visit Moses. But when he describes himself, he describes himself as God Almighty. And now you're left wondering, okay, an angel and he's describing himself as God Almighty. He's given the honors and characteristics of who God looks like. And when you think very carefully, you actually realize that this angel of the Lord, as the Old Testament describes him, did so for lack of words. But what we actually see here is the, what we would call in theology the pre-incarnate appearances of Christ. Some theologians have called it a theophany, the appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament times before he was manifested in the flesh. And that is why he has power to judge nations. He brings messages and pronounces himself as God. And when he speaks, in fact, God has spoken. If you remember the angel, rather, when uh, God promised uh, Abraham that Sarah, his wife, would give birth to a son, we do not see God physically coming and speaking to Abraham. We see three angels. 
and one of the three angels is the one describing how a son will be born at around this time next year but when he describes himself he describes himself as god later these three angels go towards sodom and gomorrah the other two angels continue down and god stays behind and he's speaking with abraham so you can see that there are the, the, the expression or manifestation of different personalities of God appears as early as the Old Testament times. No, what about the New Testament? Because someone might say, well, the Old Testament is confusing for us. Maybe you should tell us uh, what we find in the New Testament. What does the Bible say? Now, there are a number of Bible passages that tell us a lot, especially from the New Testament. One of them, by the way, itself being the birth of Jesus. Let me read for you Luke chapter 1, verse 35, so that you can hear how the birth of Jesus itself tells us something about the Trinity. Luke chapter 1, and let's look at verse uh, 35. It says, The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called Son of God. The Holy Spirit, first and foremost, will come upon you, right? And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, what will happen? And the power from the Most High, who? The Father in heaven. And what will be born through Mary? The Holy One who will be called Son of God. There, you see... God the Son, who is the second person of the Trinity. You see God the Holy Spirit, who is the third person of the Trinity. You see God the Father, who is the first person of the Trinity. Right at the birth of Jesus. Of course, you move forward, you come to the baptism of Jesus in Matthew chapter 63, uh, verse 16 and 17. We read that when Jesus was coming out of the water, the Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove. And a voice from heaven spoke and said, This is my son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. him. This is my son, a voice coming from heaven. And of course, if this is his son, it means the one who is speaking is the father. Mm. Right? If you have a son, you are the father. the father. But at the same time, we are told that the Holy Spirit came upon him in the form of a dove. So there you have the Father speaking, the Holy Spirit coming upon him, the Son himself being baptized. And please note that in a passage like this, where we find the three persons of the Trinity all represented, is that these people are distinct from each other. They are not one and the same. The Father is speaking from heaven. At the same time, the Holy Spirit is coming upon Jesus. And the very same time, Jesus himself is coming out of the waters of baptism. So for someone to teach that Jesus is the Father is absurd. Or for someone to say that Jesus was the Holy Spirit is absurd. These are three personalities appearing together in the same place. And then someone stands and says, no, they are just titles. But how could titles be conversing with each other, doing things together? Yet, at the same time, separate from one another. You come to the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, you find the same scenario. That Jesus, who is giving the Great Commission mandate to the disciples, number one, he says, go and make disciples of all nations. nations. Those who believe, baptize them in the name. Not names. The name is singular. But the name of who? The of Father. the Father and of the Son and of the what? Of the oh. Holy Spirit. These are not three names. It is the name, but the name of the three persons. persons. The Great Commission itself makes it clear that these are three persons, yet they are different from each other, even though they are one. You look at the apostolic benediction in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. We usually like to say this in church. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. The grace of who? Of the Lord Jesus Christ. The love of 
God, God meaning the Father, the, Father, the fellowship of the, the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. The three persons are all together in the same passage. The apostles are not making any apology for maybe mistakenly mentioning the three, meaning they themselves assumed that the audience of their day understood that the Trinity was a teaching of the Bible. Yet, while in, 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 uh, in these other Bible passages we've talked about, we see three distinct persons. In this benediction, we see them playing different roles. You see, the Apostle Paul describes them based on what they do. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of, of the God, Lord. and the fellowship of the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit, describing them by their roles. These are distinct persons playing different role, roles within the unity of the Trinity, yet accomplishing one goal and one mind, because remember there is one God, and he has one mind, and he has one will. But within that one will, the three persons work together to fulfill that one will. When the Apostle Paul is talking about spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 and 5, again, he reminds us of the Trinity, but even more importantly, of the presence of the Trinity. He says that now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. And there are varieties of effects, but the same God who works in all things and in all persons. So within these ministry giftings that God has given the church, we see the Spirit, we see the Lord, we see God, capital G-O-D. Who are these people? If you deny that there are three persons within the Trinity, how do you describe what the Apostle Paul is saying here? Is the Apostle Paul saying that the Spirit is the Lord and at the same time he is God? Certainly not. Yet we see the Trinity, the, all the three persons are involved in giving the church the gifts that they need to grow in their unity and in their maturity. And if you ever had any doubt, Peter will dispel all your doubts in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, Peter describes the Trinity saying, and remember he's writing to suffering believers, so he says that according to the knowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, that you may obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. Three persons. They are not one. Again, as you can see, they are playing different roles. The foreknowledge of God the Father, the sanctifying work of the Spirit, so that there might be obedience to Jesus Christ. These three are distinct persons. They are all God. The Spirit is God. The Father is God. The Son is God. They are co-equal. They receive the same status. They receive the same address. They receive the same honors. In Jude verses 20 and 21, Jude says that, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Three persons are mentioned again. The Spirit of, they are to pray in the Holy Spirit. They are to keep themselves in the love of God the Father, while they are waiting anxiously for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when someone says, no, Jesus is the one who is the Father, then they have a burden of explanation on what this verse is talking about. Because the verse clearly talks of the Holy Spirit, talks of Jesus the Lord, talks of God the Father, and we see that they are not the same they are distinct and they are actually playing different roles. Now at this point, uh, now the issue of role and distinguishing what they do seems to center uh, what you are saying. Mm, mm. Could we try to distinguish and, and show the different responsibilities of the different persons mm, that mm. should be able to help us distinguish well mm, what mm. the Father does, what the mm, Son mm. does, and what the Holy Spirit does. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, maybe for us to get that uh, very well, 
it would be important that we first think about who these people are before we can answer the what they do. Okay. Once the who is understood and established, then we can now see the differences. So in understanding the, the Trinity, you want to begin by understanding the unity of the Godhead before you can understand the diversity within the Godhead. Now, there is a, an acronym that some scholars have developed called HANDS, or H-A-N-D-S. And what they mean here is that one proof that the three persons are all God and how we know that they really are. We see it through this acronym. For instance, that all the three persons of the Trinity receive the same honors. In the Bible, we see Jesus receiving worship. We see people putting their faith in him for healing, for deliverance, for salvation. In the scriptures, we see the uh, people pray to Jesus just as they pray to the Father and as they pray to the Holy Spirit. So we see that all the three receive the honors that normally we would give God. No one would worship another person unless they, 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 they are weird or they, 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 they do not understand what they are doing. But when we talk about worship, principally we are talking about worship of the sovereign God. And in the scriptures where we see God receiving worship, the same worship is given to the Father, given to the Son, and given to the Holy Spirit. So in terms of honors, they receive all the honors that only God alone deserves. But number two, we see that they all share the same attributes or characteristics of what it means to be God. For instance, we will see that the Father is eternal, the Son is eternal, the Holy Spirit is eternal. Right from the book of Genesis, we are told about the Spirit of God hovering over the waters even before God began the creation work. God the Father is creating, saying, let there be. The Holy Spirit is hovering over the waters. And within the same breath, when we come to the book of Colossians, we are told that Jesus is, is the one through whom and by him and for whom the whole of creation was made and exists. In fact, Colossians chapter 1 calls him the creator of everything, both visible and invisible. So you see that not, not only in terms of creation, uh, what they do, but in the fact that they were there even before creation came to be. Jesus later in the Gospel of John will teach and say, Before Abraham was, I am. And by using the word I am, he's using the self-designation of God in the book of Exodus, where God tells Moses that his name is I am who I am. Meaning he's saying, I am the eternal one who has always been, even before your father Abraham that you respect very much came to be. The same attribute of eternality, we see it on the Holy Spirit, that he is eternal, the father is eternal, the son is eternal. You look at the aspect of, for instance, omnipresence. We see that the same as attribute of omnipresence or being everywhere present is attributed to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. You talk about the unchangeable nature of God, something that defines God and makes him distinct from any other created being, and the same will be given to Jesus, the same will be given to the Holy Spirit. In the book of Hebrews, you read of Jesus where the writer says that how he was yesterday, today he is and forever will be. He does not change. Now, what about the names? We've looked at the honors, which is H, the attributes, which is A, the names. Now, let's look at the names. Do you notice that in scripture, whether you go in the Old Testament or in the New, that Jesus is called God, the Holy Spirit is called God, the Father is called God. The Father is called Lord, Jesus is called Lord, the Holy Spirit is called Lord. And there are several Bible passages I could give that show us those designations or descriptions. But you will also notice that both the Father and the Son are also described as saviors. In several Bible passages, we read about God, the Savior, we read about Jesus, our Savior. So, they are all called the same names, but these are names that you would give to only God and no one else. You don't know anyone else who would be called Savior in the scriptures apart from God. 
No one would be called Lord or God himself apart from the God of the Bible. But we see that these names are given to all the three persons, meaning that the scripture recognizes their equality. The scripture recognizes that they are the one God, even though they are three different persons. What about their deeds? So now we come to D. Remember, we are using the acronym HAND. H A N. We've looked at honors, attributes, names. Now let's look at their deeds. Their deeds, we are thinking of creation, we are thinking of forgiveness of sins, we are thinking of judging the world. Now we know that all these things belong to God. God is the creator, God is the one who forgives sins, God is the only one who will judge the world. But then you look at several Bible passages and you will realize that the, the, the aspect of creation is attributed to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in Genesis is the agent of creation. The Father is the one decreeing creation. But in Colossians, even in John chapter 1, by the way, we are told that for by him and through him and for him everything was made. And John repeats it emphatically and says, in fact, nothing was made without him. So creation is attributed to the Son, attributed to the Holy Spirit, attributed to the Father. Again, these are not three gods because the Bible does not teach any god more than the one god of the Bible. But within that one god, we see three persons all being given the designation of creator. What about forgiveness of sins? The Bible tells us that only God can forgive sins. Yet at the same time, we see Jesus not only pronounce forgiveness of sins, but in fact even demonstrates it. Like when you read in Mark chapter 2, where he heals a paralytic, he demonstrates that he has ability to forgive sins by performing a miracle and healing this paralytic and making him to walk again. And what is the rationale behind that miracle? He says that so that you may know that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins. Now, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law in their day understood that Jesus was claiming to be God because they knew only God could forgive sins. So they are even thinking it in their mind. And Jesus, who is all-knowing, which is another attribute only given to God, he knows what they are thinking and he asks them, why are you surprised? Which is harder? To pronounce forgiveness of sins or to make the man walk. And by performing the miracle, he proves that he is actually God. And that is why he has the ability to forgive sins. Yes. But at the same time, you see the Holy Spirit also given the same designation as a forgiver of sins. Meaning that these three persons are all God. Now you come to the last letter, which is S. S meaning the seat or the throne of God. And we notice that when it comes to rulership, the three persons of the Trinity all share the throne. Not in a way that one sits in the morning and the other sits there in the afternoon. But no, 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 no. <laughs> that they all, we are told that they all rule on the throne of God. So how can three different people rule on the same throne of God? But what we find here is that actually when God sits on the throne, all the three have sat because within the one God are the three persons. We read Hebrew like Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, verse 13. You read John chapter 1 verse 18. The Father, God the Father is sitting on the throne. You read Philippians 2, 10 or Hebrews 1, 2. Jesus is sitting on the throne, the Son. You read Ephesians 1, 19 to 21, the Holy Spirit is sitting on the throne. This can only be possible if the three are one God. If they were three gods, then we would have a problem. Can Who you try to picture throne? three gods trying to sit on the same throne? <laughs> You'd have a walk. It just would not make sense. Now, having understood the unity of the Godhead, recognizing that the three all are actually God, then we begin to ask ourselves, so what about the differences? 
I have met a number of people who will tell you that you see Jesus could not have been God because he himself said he was lesser than the Father. So if he was God, how can he at the same time be less? Now, hopefully when we come back from the break, we can talk about how the different roles work together within the relationships in the Trinity and why sometimes certain Bible passages depict one of the persons of the Trinity as being less, which sometimes has caused confusion and made many to wonder whether the three persons are co-equal within this doctrine of the Trinity. But there is a clear explanation for that, and the scriptures will help us understand this as well. So when you get that uh, point of, of view as per what uh, scripture says, you want to be there still in the last episode today. So don't touch your dial. When we return from the break, we'll be getting that bit of today's discussion. See you when we return. This is Church of Uganda Family TV. Enriching Lives. Welcome back from that uh, short break. We needed to pass that so that we can get the last bit of the show and then uh, we can call it a good night for, from us here. But nevertheless, we are still discussing the Trinity and, and, and uh, this has confused many, but I'm happy that uh, Reverend Rogers is making things clear. I must admit that I'm in class now, so... <laughs> <laughs> the next guys will meet me from after this show. Be, be rest assured that you'll get correct stuff <laughs> concerning the Trinity. Uh, that, 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 is, uh, that, uh, that, that having been said, we want to look at the different roles of the Trinity. What does the, uh, God the Father do, God the Son, and then God the Holy Spirit, the three persons. So when we look at those three, we'll also look at why, 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 why look at, why waste our one hour here discussing Trinity? And why should they be three and not five and not two and a half? So we'll also uh, look, look into that bit uh, in, the, in the remaining uh, 13 or so minutes to make sure today's topic is fully covered. So look at the roles, the different roles of the God the Father and then the roles of God the Son and then God the Holy Spirit and then we'll wind it up with why, what is the importance of looking at the Trinity. Reverend Rogers, uh, would you like to pick it up from there and let's discuss the roles, the roles of the, of the different uh, uh, persons of the, of the Trinity. Brothers and sisters, it's a privilege to be back from the break and to continue to speak to you. I must remind you that we are talking about one of the most profound mysteries of God but we are privileged that God has even revealed this much about himself to us. Because without this revelation, there is no field of education, whether science or otherwise, that would ever teach you about this mysterious relationship, about who God is. And as we discuss this topic, it is important that you also remember that we are not discussing for the sake of trying to decipher the mystery in the Trinity. But what we are saying is that it is actually a very important and foundational doctrine of the Christian faith that upon this doctrine, Christianity stands or falls. You see, God has not just revealed himself as one. He has revealed himself as a unity of, the, of three persons that are distinct from one another, yet each one of them is God fully and truly. And this becomes very important because when God relates with humanity or his creation, we will see him relating with us through the three persons, each one of them playing a certain role to fulfill the one goal that the one God is accomplishing in all his creation. A famous verse that we Christians usually talk about is John chapter 3 verse 16 where we read that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. And usually when the Bible uses the word God in general, it is actually referring to the Father as differentiated from Jesus who is God the Son manifesting in human flesh. So when we read John 3.16 and say God so loved the world, we are actually talking about the Father. 
But you will notice that while the father expresses his love for the world, he's not the one who comes to save the world. He sends his son. And his son, Jesus Christ, lives and perfectly obeys the law that humanity had broken. Yet innocent and blameless as he was, takes him upon himself the penalty of uh, the, 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 the sinfulness of mankind and dies and rises on our behalf. God loves the world, but he sends his son to die. His son dies and dies on our behalf. Now, when the son has died, what happens? That the third person of the Trinity, or God the Holy Spirit, also plays a role in our salvation. In fact, we are told that he is the one who opens our hearts unto salvation. He is the one who gives us the gift of faith to believe and to acknowledge Christ Jesus as our personal Savior and Lord. The Holy Spirit convinces us of the truthfulness of the gospel message. He convicts us of sin, of righteousness and judgment. He opens our hearts to receive the message of the gospel in which the death of Christ Jesus and his resurrection are applied to us. Our sins are dealt with in Christ. We receive Christ's righteousness and we are pronounced saved or we are pronounced now children of God. So we see that while the Father orchestrates the process of salvation, the Son accomplishes our salvation. The Holy Spirit applies the benefits of Christ's death resulting in our salvation. Have you ever wondered if God was not existing as a triune God, if these three persons were not there, how our salvation would come about? Imagine if Jesus the Son was not there to die for us. How would God have forgiven us? Because his justice demanded a substitutionary sacrifice. Someone who would die on behalf of sinners. And of course, when we talk about Jesus or the second person of the Trinity, you notice that Jesus, while God, is also a fully man. He is in human flesh, in a human body. And that is what makes it possible for him to die for us. Because if he only were a spirit, spirits do not die. So again, God is very intentional that in Jesus becoming man, it is so set in a way that he is able, one, to become the sacrifice for our sins, to suffer in our very flesh the condemnation and the penalty of our sinfulness, and through that, we, we may receive forgiveness of sin. Now, imagine if Jesus had died well and good, but the Holy Spirit was not there to convince us, to convict us, to convert us, to confirm in us that Jesus has become Savior of our lives. How would our salvation become possible? So people who deny or dispute the teaching of the Trinity are not making a simple error as many of us may think. Some of us might, might think that it's just a matter of difference in opinion. Some people believe in a God who is in three persons. Others just believe one, but it really doesn't matter. No, thank you. It actually does matter. That for God, even to save us, for our salvation to be possible, that the three persons of the Trinity must play different roles to accomplish the one salvation. Now, in their playing these different roles, you will notice that they also assume different levels of relationships and accountability. And usually that's the source of contention for so many. Especially those who read about Jesus saying, talking about his father in heaven, how his father has commanded him, how his father has sent him. They conclude and say, you see, the son is less than the father. And if he is less than, therefore he cannot be God at the same time. But what they do not realize is that the position Jesus assumes as God in a human body is a role in which he must be subordinate to the Father in order for that relationship to work. And because he plays a role that is different from the Father, doesn't mean that he is lesser. We all know, for instance, that in a family, husband and wife are equal. At least that's the teaching of scripture according to the Christian faith. They are all created in God's image. But because of the different roles they play, 
the wife is expected to submit to her husband as the church submits to Christ. The husband is expected to love and submit to the wife according to the model of Jesus and how he sacrifices himself for his church, the bride. Now, does that mean because the wife plays a subordinate role that she is now less a person? Of course not. She is still equal, co-equal with her husband in terms of her value as a human being and God's image bearer. But for the purposes of playing different roles, one is uh, in a place of more authority, the other one is not. Like when we read in Philippians chapter 2, uh, from verses 6 to around 11, we are told that even though Jesus was in the form of God, he did not co consider equality with God as something to fight for. Rather, lowering himself, he came as a man, suffered as a man, even unto the point of death. So Paul begins by reminding us that in terms of essence or nature, Jesus was God. But for the sake of his role of saving mankind, he assumed a human body. And within that human body, he underwent the limitations of a human being in a limited, sinful, wicked world. He endured the sufferings and the troubles of a sinful world. Not that he had ceased to be God, but for the purpose of playing that role. When we talk about Jesus, we are not talking about a man who was exalted to become God. We are talking about God who humbled himself to become man. And in becoming man, he did not stop being God. He assumed a human body. And that is why when Paul pre talks about, talks about him in Colossians chapter 2, he says that for in him the whole of God, God of, of, of deity dwells bodily in him. That the whole essence of God, the nature of God, what it means to be God is wrapped up in the human body in the person of Jesus. And that's why we will see when we go back to Philippians chapter 2 that when Jesus had played this role, lived, suffered, and died for mankind, how does the passage end? that God has exalted him above every other name, that at the mention of his name every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Remember the title Lord is only reserved for God. So again, Paul is reminding us, even though he suffered as a man, even though he went to death on the cross, he still had the same honors and characteristics and attributes of God. And that is why he is exalted as Lord to the glory of God the Father. We see the two persons of the Trinity mentioned in that passage. But even in the place of his humiliation, Jesus was still God. But the only way he could save us was to come down among us, share in our humanity, endure our own sufferings, and be the perfect mediator between sinful humanity and the holy God. Because only one who is of God and of man could bring reconciliation between the two entities, man and God. So you can see that without the Trinity, our salvation is not possible. And of course, there are so many things that make the Trinity important. Did you notice that even for us to understand God's love or experience it, the Trinity must be possible? Because how would have God known how to love if he were only alone within the Godhead? But within this Godhead, we see a God who is, we see the three persons in love with one another and that eternally. And as they express their profound love with one another, that love is mirrored down to us. And we are able to experience what is happening within the relationship and the fellowship of the Trinity. That even before God could share what he has with us, he already shared it within the persons of the Godhead. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Trinity is extremely important. It is at the heart of our very salvation, and without it, salvation is not possible. It is at the heart of our own Christian convictions. 
you realize even when Jesus gives the Great Commission, it is basically an extension of the work of the Trinity. What the Trinity has already been doing is now extended through the ministry and the work of the apostles. And it is a making of a project of the making of disciples in the name of who? Of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. That no matter where you look, these three persons work together to fulfill the same work of the one God who is trying to save his people from their sins. But he is doing it through the person of the Father, through the person of the Son, through the person of the Holy Spirit. Not that there are three gods, but three persons in one God. And this one triune God through the three persons of the Trinity accomplishes our salvation, accomplishes creation, will accomplish the recreation of the world, and will bring glory to himself in the consummation of all things. We thank you very much for keeping it locked on Church of Uganda Family TV, where we enrich lives. This is a very delicate topic, and uh, you, you don't want to over interject as... Uh, Reverend Rogers is throwing these things to our face so that you get it right. Otherwise, we thank you very much for keeping it locked here uh, on this episode of Let's Talk. I can assure you next Tuesday, I will still have Reverend Rogers here with me to discuss another sensitive topic for the benefit of the church, of the country, and East Africa at large. Thank you very much. My name is Emmanuel Odeke. And Reverend Rogers, thank you for making time always to come through. It's always a big pleasure to have you and every time you're here we are sure everything will come right because uh, this is stuff that is thoroughly researched. So we thank you so much from I and the team. Uh, Emma is behind the cameras. Uh, I don't know how it happens that we share the name but nevertheless it's a good night from Church of Uganda Family TV. God bless you. God bless Uganda. Let's talk. Let's talk. Let's talk is an uncensored program on Family TV that attempts to answer questions that are unanswered within our church settings. Questions like sex and money, uh, drugs and alcoholism, prophecy and prophets in our country. This is Church of Uganda Family TV, enriching lives.